Well, Jeff, it's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too, brother. So we were just talking about uh, how important it is to lift weights. Did you work out today? I did. Did you? I did, yeah. I did too. Okay. Because uh, how you said something about how important it is and you learn the hard way. So I wanted to, what I was trying to say right there and we were waiting for the cameras to roll was uh, I learned the hard way too, but in, probably in a different way because I started off just thinking that it was a part of life just because my dad was a bodybuilder and he taught me at a very, like I started working at like 13 and then it just was like became a part of my life. So I didn't really understand how important it was until I, I started doing drugs and doing all this and then stopped working out for so long and lost weight. And because even when I was doing drugs, I would I did steroids and then started working out even more. Yeah. So I was like, oh, it's just a part of life. I just literally thought it was a part of life. That's how ingrained it was that when I, even when I was a junkie, I was lifting weights. But um, then I stopped because the steroids messed me up mentally and physically. Yeah. Anyways, um, once I stopped, lost all this weight and I was like, uh, uh, it, I had this weird thing. Uh, the music w that I was listening to was kind of influencing me in a negative way that uh, I kind of wanted to l have this look of being a junkie. Yeah, I think I you, that. yeah, I remember mm -hmm. I was listening to Lil Peep and stuff like that. And he kind of like uh, influenced me to like want that. And then I realized quick that this is terrible and it's like, it's not something to be influenced by. But, uh, but then uh, once I started lifting weights again, I was like, damn, dude, I feel so much better. Like just the first time working out after going through that three-year stint of not working out, I was like, damn, dude, it's so important. So what, what was your journey like with that, with understanding how, how you understood it was important? So I was not athletic in high school. I was okay. A, I was a partier. Okay. I started using uh, cocaine, other hard drugs. Yep. Even um, in high school? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that's, that was an early start. What about you? I never really did super, like, got into super hard drugs. I, like, experimented and tried out. When's your first time that you experimented? The first time I, I guess, I was, like, 23, 24, like, going to EDC. Oh, okay, so that's around the same time as me. Um, yeah. Okay, but go I ahead. So I just, my, my focus in my teen years was just having fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? I didn't, I just didn't want the party to stop. Makes sense. And that, that carried into my twenties in my early twenties, meth became my real, my real vice. Yep. And by the age of like 24, I had gotten involved with a group that w was manufacturing. Okay. And I started manufacturing. Wow. Okay. Hold on. What year was this around? Uh, if you don't mind me asking. No, it's like 90, 99, 98, 99, Okay, 2000. okay, and you were in your 20s, so. Late 20s. Okay, okay, so, because I was, that's interesting because my mom's ex-boyfriend uh, told me about how popular that, I think he called it biker meth or something, is that yeah. a thing? That's what he called, he, uh, I think biker he met drug. Chris one time, but he told me about uh, how, cause he used to do the same thing. He used to literally bury, he had so much of it, didn't know what to do with it, that he'd have to bury it and, and, and in his backyard, like in holes because he just didn't know what to do. I didn't realize how big that was here in Vegas, that biker meth was a thing. And it was, I guess it was the best type, but okay, go ahead. It was extremely easy to get your hands on what you needed to make it. That's I mean, wild. You could literally go to like two stores and walk out with everything you needed to make phosphorus. Wow. Oil. That's crazy. That's a whole, you literally just, what I mean, the back fuck? Then, That's so crazy. So this was before Metro and the police had like caught on to like oh. how it was flooding the streets. Mm -hmm. People started getting busted. People started snitching. You know what I mean? And they, mm. they actually, I, I remember a time hearing stories of where, you know, Dope cooks that they caught were teaching them oh, wow. how the process was was done, where the where the chemicals were coming from. Oh shit! Yeah, but you could literally walk into like Jones Feed, walk out with a flask, a hose, iodine crystals, red phosphorus, and Damn. Then you could go to a smoke shop and get like they used to sell huge bottles of like a thousand count pure ephedrine pills. Is it, and the, the smoke shop knew that, that that's what it was for, that people were using that for? Well, it, it, it's like Sudafed, so it's, it's 
it's it's labeled for the use of like um, cold flu or oh i allergy, see allergy pills oh wow and smoke shops that's wild okay kind well, of, it's kind of like going the, to a smoke shop nowadays and you're going to find all kinds of synthetic oh for yeah, sure that's what, literally what i was just going to say like even with the galaxy gas or whatever that's called the the whippets that they're do, that they're just sell and people are ruining their lives over it over yeah over like that uh flavored whippets bro that's, that's crazy crazy. It's crazy i've never even done a whippet in my life but my ex-girlfriend Ugh. literally was just on no jumper that she got addicted to whippets it's crazy and she almost lost her legs from it that's wild. Yeah. That's well, crazy. Well, has a crazy comeback story, and then maybe you could, like, get into that. How you yeah, let's... So just real quick, I'll just go, kind of go through the journey let's and see fast it. forward. I got into big trouble with the law. I became a, became a felon in 2001. I got convicted of manufacturing, trafficking, compounding, and illegal substances. Okay. And I had, like, a six-year struggle with, like, the law and wrestling internally with, like... You know, in, in, in the recovery journey, they, yep. you know, they teach you that you're powerless over these things. And I was just raised to believe that, like, I could, I could do anything I set my mind to do. Right, right, right. You know, that I could overcome any obstacle. Yeah. And, like, I was trying to apply that logic to, mm -hmm. like, my drug use and in the drug mm -hmm. scene. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it'll work. And it, huh? <laughs> I said it'll work for sure. Well, it works sometimes, yeah. you know what I mean? But eventually, like, I had to, it was like the first time in my life where in 2006, my final arrest is what led me into the drug court program. And I what's, was, what's a drug court program? So the drug court program is where if you're convicted of a serious drug offense, they will give you an opportunity to enter into a treatment program mm -hmm. that's monitored by the courts. Oh, so I see. I see. It's kind of like going, a rehab. Yeah. Instead of going to prison for six years, they said, okay, you do this year long treatment program. Oh, okay. And, and then we'll put, we'll put you on probation. Yeah. And if you're in compliance, then you, you don't have to go to prison. So I okay. opted into oh, that. Really? Yeah. So in 2006, yep. uh, March 28th, uh, I was so physically and, and emotionally and psychologically dependent on substances that it, I literally couldn't stop. And so the only way that I was able to stop was to go to the detention center for a few weeks, dry out there, and I got out, and I was just tired. Yeah. And I knew I didn't want to go back to that lifestyle. And I had to relearn, like, my entire life. Everyone I knew partied the way I partied. Yeah. Everyone I knew, you know what I mean? When you're cooking dope, you know, you have people surrounding you that will go and boost chems, boost pills, boost whatever, bring to you trade for dope, all mm -hmm. those things. And it was a, it was a massive transition into a new lifestyle. And yeah. I was 32 at the time. I thought the ship had sailed. I had no idea what I was going to do in my future. Wow. And, um, you know, just after like a 15, 16 year, uh, bender, bender <laughs> I'm like, you know, what the hell am I going to do? Yeah. And, and so the first year was just really, really tough, you know, psychologically, um, moving away from the people I knew and the places I was used to and the things I used to was used to. Mm. Then I met a, I met a, a, so when I got sober, like you could imagine me on meth, I'm like 145 yep. soaking wet. Yep. And I get, I get sober and I know nothing about keeping myself physically well. And so I, I blew up. I gained like 120 pounds my first year of being sober. No way. Because my body was so starved. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, so, so explain. So you basically, your first year sober, you, anything you ate just stuck to yeah, you? Yeah, well, I wasn't exercising. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. You know what I mean? So what happened was I blew up to my heaviest was two, around 270. Oh, wow. I get married. I have a couple kids. Mm -hmm. I develop... Uh, Type two diabetes, I develop. Oh my gosh! Hypertension, I yeah. develop high cholesterol. You know all of these things I know nothing about. Yeah, because I had never paid attention to like my physical well being before. Right. So there was an incident I was just talking to Oscar about where I I uh, I passed out mm -hmm. due to due to my high blood sugar. Fell down the stairs with my kid in my arm. Oh my goodness! I woke up and I was like, something's wrong. Yeah, I, I know something's wrong. Sometimes you know you don't know how bad you feel until you start to feel better, right? Of course, I know like, that. I, I knew, know that exactly. Yeah, you know, like I knew that like 
something's wrong. If I if I'm blacking out, yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah. I went to the ER. They're like, your blood sugar is 700. You know, you need to see a doctor. Wow. So they gave me some temporary meds. I went and I saw a doctor who happened to be a friend of mine. Yep. And he's like, bro, I got bad news for you. You're a ticking time bomb. You are not gonna live. My kids were like like one and three at the time. And if you don't want me asking at around this time, what were you doing uh, to sustain like your career? Like what were you doing as a job around this time? So I became a limousine driver. Okay. While I was in very important to know. Okay, cool. (laughs) And then, and within six months they made me the general manager of this limousine company. What? That's awesome. Okay. Crazy story. Uh, A lot of people were were resentful about that, but Hmm. the doctor told me like, bro, if you don't do something about your condition, you're not going to live to see your kids graduate high school. Wow. That's that was a, exactly what I needed to hear. You yeah. Know what I mean? yeah. So Wild. I was fat. I was, I was lazy. I was tired all the time. I didn't feel good. And a buddy of mine said, you need to do CrossFit. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like Talk about dying. <laughs> so I tried CrossFit for like two months and I got like four injuries. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And I'm like, okay, so CrossFit's not for me. No. Yeah, especially at that level. CrossFit yeah, is yeah. not for me. But this was a guy, he, he was a great friend of mine, and I know he was well intentioned, but yeah, like, yeah. you know, you don't go from being fat, lazy, <laughs> and never have worked out just to like, CrossFit. CrossFit. Right so my CrossFit journey ended relatively quickly. Um, I ended up having to have a knee surgery because I tore a meniscus from CrossFit. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And yeah. Had, and I got a shoulder injury and a wrist injury. <laughs> so you, you, not only shape. were you doing CrossFit, is you were pushing yourself hard at CrossFit from zero to, is from nothing to something. Yeah, because I got a huge ego, right? Yeah. <laughs> And you yeah. have an addictive personality, so yeah, I, I so like, you probably saw CrossFit and you're like, I'm gonna put well, my all into it. I'm like, I got Damn. this, bro. Like, oh, and as, you applied that logic that you were talking about earlier to yeah, it, probably. Yeah. Like, oh my this. goodness. I can compete with these. And the guys. universe just said, "Yep." You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I just remember thinking, "Fuck, I could, I could fucking swing on the jungle gym." <laughs> oh my <laughs> goodness! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elementary yeah. school, like, I could do those things. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I learned the hard way. So. I stopped doing CrossFit and I I looked into like just investing into myself at the, at the request of uh, a mentor of mine. And I, I hired a trainer who could work with me uh, and put me on a reasonable exercise regimen. Just regular workout. And then help me with my diet too. Okay, cool. So this is when, so this was 2000, 2000, Five. Okay, and you were like thirty-three. I was like, no, I was like thirty-five at the okay, time. Okay, okay. And was your like help you becoming healthy and strong like synonymous with like building crossroads and getting into that level or that that transition? Well, they they happen to be they happen to be concurrent. Yeah. And obviously, like the better I started to look and feel the better I could show up, the more clarity I had in my mind. Um, so, yeah, can you go into, I, I don't think Quest knows your, uh, about Crossroads or what it is and how impactful it is in the community and what, like, how that came to be. Because I think that's that's crazy from, like, I mean, I know your story. I mean, I, the more you tell it, the more I, I learn about it. But, like, yeah. how you became from, like, manufacturing dope to, like, then being overweight, unhealthy, unhappy, then to like becoming healthy, happy, and then building Crossroads, which is... So I had, I just, Crossroads came into it 2018. Freedom House was first. Freedom, oh, okay. Freedom House is a, it's a transitional living center and it's an inpatient drug and alcohol wow. treatment program. Okay. That's primarily devoted towards helping people in the criminal justice system. Oh, wow. Okay. So having gone through the system here and understanding some of the deficits yep. and lack of resources for guys like me, yep. like the last few years I was essentially homeless. Yep. You know what I mean? I was couch surfing. I always kind of like found a place to stay, but, um, I remember the day there was like an article in the paper and it was the governor's wife at the time uh, launching an initiative called Crystal Darkness, Mm -hmm. the Crystal Darkness campaign. And 
there was a foundation that was working to eradicate the in, in in conjunction with law enforcement kind of eradicate the meth labs okay because they were just everywhere and i just remember thinking to myself man if if i'm gonna really change my life i've got to do something drastic so is this before you started working out or or just recently right around the same time oh, okay okay so in 2009 i opened a place called the freedom house it's okay. 140 bed facility. and what made you like I I know what made you, but like how did you even think that that was possible? Like, well, I had some coaches and mentors in my life that helped me overcome all those shitty thoughts in my head. You okay, I mean, like I'm 32. I didn't go to college. Yep. Which, you know, I don't. I don't. I, you know, you know the conventional wisdom says you've got to graduate high school go to college get a degree go to work for somebody mm -hmm. you know put in 30 years collect a retirement and i didn't do any of that and so luckily i had surrounded myself with some people who were motivators yep you know what i mean and who told me you know your felony status your past none of this shit de defines who you are going to be in your future what defines who you're going to be in your future are the actions you take today. Mm -hmm. And I had somebody that was in my ear about dreaming. And like I had been using drugs and numbing myself for so long that dreaming wasn't even a thing for me. Mm -hmm. Like dreaming in my sleep, maybe, but like dreaming about the kind of life I wanted was not even a thing for me. Interesting. Okay. So I started to think like, like, and dream. And I, I like, I had this idea one day. Um, there was only one place where people in the detention center who were waiting on a treatment bed could go. And it wasn't really a great place to go. Mm -hmm. They didn't provide great services. And I thought, I want to create a place where guys like me can go and, and, and get into a continuum of care that's really going to make a difference in their life. That's actually huge, dude. Like, I want to be the guy that can sit down with a guy yeah. who's day one out of the detention center hopeless full of fear insecurity mm -hmm. has no clue or direction for his future and say bro i was in your shoes and mm. this is how i did it mm -hmm. and this is how i overcame those shitty thoughts one day at a time mm -hmm. so i opened the freedom house my vision came to life mm -hmm. it today 15 years later is still the number one provider of mental health, substance use, and transitional living wow. uh, services. For so, so for for like substance use or people that are getting sober, there, how do what do you do to? Is, is it just uh, like like therapy or therapy and um, like for people that need like say methadone or anything? Is it is it like that? We do mat treatment. We do everything. So, oh, okay, okay. A guy will wait for X amount of time in the detention center who's, yep. been, who's agreed to go into a program. Okay. He'll come right to us. Get, they get transported right to us from the detention center. Okay. And, you know, some of them want to run. Some of them don't. Some of them are tired. Some of them, you know what I mean? Yep. Some of them are just playing the game. But yep. even the ones that are playing the game, a few weeks in, they start to, like, buy in. Yeah. So in a snapshot, the program is it's a three-month inpatient program treatment program which is 25 hours a week of clinical services mm -hmm. we take them out they do community service and we get them ready to go into our transitional living program okay so when they complete treatment they go into transitional housing that's where they start to learn about life skills job readiness and to become self-sufficient mm -hmm. and so we have six months with them to try to help them understand the exact things I'm talking about, right? Like it's coming back to reality, bro, basically. No matter yeah. what your past looks like, no matter what you look on paper, there's hope for a, good, a better future for you. Yep. So I opened that in 20, 20, 2009. Yep. Then in 2016, I had an opportunity to take a look at a facility that was being used to hold house like the elderly Okay. across from UMC. And, and it was like literally... It was literally the place that the state Department of Health and Human Services sent elderly people who were, they knew they were like on their way out. Mm. Mm. And so they got a bare minimum care, like they housed them, they fed them, 
and they had caretakers and I said, we could create something so much more valuable to our community. Here. Mm-hmm. And Medicaid reform had just happened. So, you know, 200,000 people who were uninsured in this state all of a sudden now had medical coverage. Yep. And I don't know if you remember, but this was back, you know, eight, nine years ago. But because of that, our emergency rooms were overcrowded with drug seekers, you know, drug abusers, people with mental health crises, mm-hmm. and they were taking up beds and space in emergency rooms in the hospitals. And it was tough for people with real medical emergencies to get what they needed. Okay. So I thought, okay, so I started to dream again, right? Mm-hmm. Let's create a place where our first responders and Metro can take people that don't really need to be in a hospital. They need, they need like substance use and mental health services. Mm-hmm. So I started putting the plans together for that. And you got that place that was an old elderly home? Yep. Okay. So I, I got it. I operated it. We, we had 110 residents. I moved them out, found other group homes for them to go to, closed it down, uh, did a multi-million dollar renovation, mm-hmm. and we reopened it as Crossroads of Southern Nevada, which now serves the indigent drug and alcohol abuser population, mm-hmm. primarily homeless. Okay. So it's a 75 bed medical detox. Oh, wow. We've got 80 residential treatment beds Mm -hmm. and a separate housing facility where we can house 160 people. Oh, damn. And when they're in our housing program, they're also going to our outpatient clinic. So Crossroads in total is a nine month program Mm -hmm. and it's primarily designed for the homeless. So that's wild, dude. That's we, pretty dope. We uh, we started a foundation called the Shine a Light Foundation. I don't know if you know, there's thousands of people living in the storm drains underneath Las Vegas. Oh, yep. I know that. So the Shine a Light Foundation has an outreach program. We've got like 60 to 70 volunteers a week that go out and just spread a message of hope and love to these people that when they're ready, there's a place that they can go. And a lot of them end up at Crossroads. Oh, wow. So, so... How, my question is like, does insurance take care of those people or do, does, yeah, do so they, they just... All have, so, so they all have Medicaid. Okay, okay. And then the county provides a contract for us for the truly uninsured. So like, we don't have to turn anyone away. Okay, cool. Dude, you know what I mean? Dope. I mean, and why I love Jeff's story so much is because it's like, he went from, you know, like the bottom of the bottom, like yeah. addicted, homeless, incarcerated, to overcoming that to a regular life and then just impacting the community at such a high scale. And not just like the community at large, it's like the people that specifically deal with those challenges. Yeah, but people that o- always get overlooked or that n- people just look down upon and you're taking taking care of them is huge because I remember when I was trying to look for, I never went to a rehab because I, I've been an entrepreneur for so long and I've never had health insurance. Right. So like, I remember, oh my gosh, I remember calling so many different rehabs. Like, I just want to be there. You know what I mean? And them saying, sorry, you don't have insurance. Can't. And I was like, dude, I just want help. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this, how, how long does it, like, I just need help. So that's huge right there because I just remember being that person too. And being like, there's no way that I finally have the courage to be like, I want, and I'm asking for help and them saying, fuck off. You just got to stay home and deal with everything yourself, which I did. But, uh, right. What you're telling me is like huge because I'm like, damn, he's just taking care of everybody, which is, which is awesome. That was my mission. You know, the 12th step in the recovery program I got sober using is, is giving back the miracle we've been given. Yeah. And so I, I really took that pretty, to I guess an extreme, yeah. You know what I mean. And yeah. I'm born and raised here. Yeah, me too. And you too, I, right? I just, I just, I knew that there was such a lack of services, and I'm like, this is fucking crazy. Yeah. That a guy like me, who was on the streets of, I'm a felon. I'm all these things, and I'm the one that puts together a vision and a dream mm-hmm. to help the underdog. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that I is found, huge. I found a lot of joy in that. And I also, like, one of my biggest things is creating opportunities for others. Yeah. And so in creating these programs, aside from the clinical and medical licensed staff, 
the majority of my employees are people with the lived experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a guy that's new that's coming in gets to sit and talk with a guy that maybe a year or two was just in his shoes. Mm -hmm. And like, dude, if you want to leave, like, we get that. I get that. I know mm -hmm. the feeling of like wanting to run because this is a scary process to yeah. embrace. Yeah. But just stay one more day. Yeah. <laughs> Just Take it a day tonight. at a time, yeah. Just stay tonight, and tomorrow you might feel different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Does, so, that, does that usually change people's minds after a day? Or does. if they sleep if on it? If it's coming from the right person. Yeah. If it's coming from a therapist, right. you know what I mean? And I'm the same way. Like, yeah. I went through a lot of therapy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you don't know what I've been through. Yeah. You don't know the pain I'm experiencing. Yeah. You don't know what it's like to feel like the way I feel. Right. You know, yeah, it literally so has to come from somebody that flying went through out that. of your mouth is going to resonate with me yeah. because this is your job. This is what you're paid to do. And you have no idea what I'm going through. Right. Makes sense. And so, yeah, we've created some some programs that are unique and different and have literally served tens of thousands of people over the, the last 15 years in this community. And that's probably my most uh the accomplishment I'm most proud of is just like making a difference in, you know, if I make a difference in one life, you know, I think back and I look at the, the people that like had their hand out and helped me in the beginning, like look at the ripple effect of what can, what, what the possibilities are, right? Mm -hmm. So kindness, motivation, inspiration are my things. I've kind of carried that into the new business I'm in, which I've been in the solar business for five years. Mm -hmm. um, and I and the majority of my pe people that are super successful in solar are guys that have come through my program. Oh, wow. That just want to work hard and make a decent living. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, man. Hustle and motivate. That's it. <laughs> so so now that's kind of what you're you're fo just focused on uh, juggling all the, that stuff. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a juggler. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably a lot of fires you uh, you got to put out daily juggler, from that. Yeah. 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 So I want to know some more about like your your story because you it sounds like you grew up taking good care of your health. Yeah, it was. It I had I, a dip, slipped into some addiction. It's because I didn't. So when you yeah, let's start the question story from the beginning. So when you base cancer. yeah, well, cancer at twelve, literally, wow. literally, uh, kind of my mind was just already like exposed. I guess the word is to just uh, reality, like what can really happen to you at a young age and uh and then i did chemotherapy for so long and getting bullied for having a pick line in my arm that kind of like uh. like kids tugging on it and it's literally connected to my heart and like getting acne all over my body literally every riddled and acne from the chemo because you're going i'm going through uh puberty while going through chemotherapy and just losing oh it was just terrible yeah. but uh after i got done with that and they, they told me i survived which it was like a high percentage of living but still going through that and then surviving it i pretty much just looked at myself in the mirror and being like i think i'm superhuman <laughs> I, I was like i am i don't care what nobody says anymore yeah, so I so um then i still got bullied pretty much all through high school until i finally started doing weight training and stuff started doing weight training uh, I knew I wanted tattoos because, funny enough, your last name is Iverson because Alan Iverson was my, oh, like, yeah. like huge inspiration to get even tattooed, play basketball. Basketball was my first love. Okay. Uh, I played basketball through high school. And then uh, once I realized I wasn't making it to the NBA, <laughs> <laughs> I started – I had a dream. I had to, like, think, like, what else? Because my mom was, like – it's funny because all I was doing was paint, watching music videos back to back to back to back. And all this time, I was constantly lifting weights, and I was in sports, you know what I mean? So, like, I, it was just, like I said, it was just ingrained in my everyday life to just lift weights and work out and just, you know what I mean? Sure. And then, uh, I, but I didn't care about my future. My mom wanted, to be, wanted me to be in the military, so I was like, definitely don't want to do that. All of my, the males in our family was in Air Force, Navy, anything. And uh, I, I literally, you don't even fail the ASVAB, but I failed it. <laughs> It's like a placement thing, and I failed okay. it, which is unheard of. But anyways, um, yeah, I just watched music videos, rap videos, and my mom was like, Quest, you got to do something. And then I remember getting my second tattoo, and she kicked me out of the house. And I went oh, to shit. my dad's house, slept on his couch for a little bit, got my first job at the airport uh, at a gym, lifting, just 
uh, checking people into the gym. And it was on the zero floor underneath the airport. So mainly like employees would go there. Mm -hmm. But I remember just because it, it was it was called Fitness Beast. So like there'd be times that I'd just be sleeping there uh, because I was the only employee that would like had nothing to do. And and I lifted it every day. So I was like, this is perfect. And uh, so that was my very first job. So yeah, basically through that, through that, like fitness beast got an airport job and I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? Dated my, got my first girlfriend bleep and, <laughs> and, uh, she was cheating on me. She was young. I was like 19 young, uh, just like getting cheated on. And this is my very first like serious relationship. And I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing? Like partying every day. This is actually the first time that I like kind of stopped working out for maybe like five, six months. And I got really skinny, skinny, but then I got, a, I became a lifeguard. And I remember the lifeguard job was finally something that showed some light from that dark relationship, um, of partying and everything. And it was a light because when I was on that stand, I could be looking at the phone and just being like, wow, uh, it's something like a like, and it like just downloading Instagram and then in under trying to understand it. And I remember uh, once I got the once I finally got the idea that I could be something bigger from just social media or Instagram. Sure. I literally just went all in, like I just remember it was like literally like a moment that I was like tunnel vision like nothing else and i saw i became that person that i wanted to be right then and there in that moment it was like surreal and uh i just <laughs> did my first thing of steroids uh instantly started getting tattoos like a lot i was already tattooed but i got started getting way more tattoos photo i hit up random people do photo shoots and i just started posting 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 followed like trying to f gain a following so i would follow like just I would follow like 7,500 people just yeah. trying to get them back and whoever didn't follow back yeah whoever didn't follow back I'd unfollow them trying to get them just and that's how I gained like 15,000 followers just following everybody unfollowing everybody following yeah. everybody that was, the OG Instagram hack. that was the only way to do it <laughs> yeah you can't you literally can't and then so that's how I gained my first little following I my ego this is this is the only negative part about it was that my ego got so inflated that I thought I was something that, that it kind of like put me into a weird negative way of like just thinking that I was bigger than other people around me. But overall it did help me because it got me separated from my high school yeah. friends that, that uh, literally was hold, holding me back in. It wasn't even their fault. It was mo mainly my fault for like letting their, their energy make me feel like I wasn't in, in the right place. But anyways, and this is around the time Pathfinder was born. Yeah. Because Cause then I met him or I've been met you, but you, you came when, uh, with, with, Once we started again, yeah, go ahead. So like, so he, he left his lifeguard job, started doing like the Instagram thing, all like all in on it. I was making music, couch surfing, everything. My job, and I, and that was about the time, like we somehow crossed paths again. I was like, Oh yeah, dude, like you're doing it. I got a studio music like, video I'm making content. Let's like partner up or something. And that's how it was like a group of us, Pathfinder was originally formed. And so we're like, uh, dude, all in every day, all we're like doing is filming content and just messing around, doing, it was like so naive at that time. We're just like making content. Just doing fun, it. Growing our followings, like just like total, just kidding yeah. stuff. That's and where I'm at now. <laughs> it's fun, right? Well, like, it is a good feeling because especially I kind of miss that feeling of yeah. of of being so hungry that you have nothing else, but that there's nothing that holds that feeling of like a group of friends that uh that you can like just you have nothing else but to succeed or else you're fucked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's where we were at. That feeling is 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 was is something that I hold dearly to my heart because I'm like, damn, dude, I just miss like couch hopping but then like being able to get this video filmed and everybody see it to make me make me uh validate why i'm couch surfing and yeah. stuff you know what i mean so that was the, the beginning we grew organically then um i met judy and then we kind of took pathfinder and made it like a legit organization but that's where the quest g usage story that's that's i guess at around that part time like we're making videos and that's when you start getting tattooed a lot you start taking like, yeah pills 
tattoos. Yeah, tat. So I started taking like uh, drugs. Basically, I think I remember my first time with my one of my exes. But then I remember that feeling. I was like, oh, maybe if I do this, it wasn't even for because it was mainly pain pills. But mm -hmm. uh, it was mainly to feel good while getting the tattoos. Being a good mood, I guess, yeah. is kind of like pain, like pain relieving too. But Anyways, I got addicted to that mainly for, like I said, I would take it and then work out on it because I just wouldn't feel any pain from the muscle yeah. lifting weights. And then I would, uh, that's, that's why it was so hard for me to quit because I was doing the drugs to work. You know what I mean? Most people will, would do drugs and just do nothing yeah. or party yeah, or yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, and, and that makes sense why they like they're struggling. But for me, I was like, I'm working and that, and that's even worse you know what i mean because then it's like a part of your daily True. thing and and it's like you you become your identity because it's like you're getting success from it yeah. until uh i went to huntington beach and i had an internship and and then uh, i started dating these porn stars i was basically the drugs i could tell that the drugs was making me make bad decisions like getting into like dating porn porn stars or like uh it would make me want to drink more or just anything like that. Yeah. And I didn't, I was, had z so much zero self-awareness that I just wouldn't even listen to like the, the intuition that would tell me not to do that. <laughs> like literally. And then, and then finally fast forward to 10 girlfriends later, I'm in Houston, Texas. It's kind of felt like that. It was just a blip, like literally like I had. And that was like literally from like 2018 to like, 2022 right? 2021 yeah 2022 yeah and you're going hard like hard i was raw dog that's, that's the way i explain it. i was raw dog in life and just Ooh. but it was it was kind of like way looking back now it felt like i, I just had such a tonal vision to I'm be really this person yeah. to being this person like sure. identity that i had and i think what i manifested was from that moment that i told you of i was like i'm gonna be this social media person and I, I think the, the universe like took who I was at that moment, took it out of my body and said, be in this tunnel. And then I ended up in Houston, Texas and woke up and I was like, what the fuck just happened? And I was doing it. I was on like these fake Adderalls that was basically like meth. Yeah. Um, I, I was on uh, fentanyl. I was just drink. Were you taking? I was taking like 100 to 150 a week, Ooh. like 50 a day sometimes. And, and then I just, but the fake Adderall, I was, I was on real Adderalls, but in Houston, they, I couldn't find any. Yeah. So these fake Adderalls, I think that's what woke me up because I was like, what the fuck is this? I was, I stayed up for 13 days straight one time, 13. So, yeah, this is the oh, awakening. I can relate. So, this was when the awakening happened. I started I hallucinating, started thinking I was like seeing God right in front of me. And then I would just see random stuff. And then basically this, my, it was basically my intuition or, or, just my my subconscious trying to tell me get the fuck away from this girl that I was with in Houston that I just found myself with because I was always using females uh, and and built up a lot of bad karma from it yeah. and I think my subconscious was manifesting in this hallucination in her house that was like just leave and I finally left anyway I got in my car started driving back to Vegas and had my first seizure ever in New Mexico, like halfway there, I was, I was like, I'm almost there, halfway there and had a seizure, flew off a 50 foot bridge, landed on the, t on all four tires, totaled the car, no scratch on me at all. Not even a little bit of injury. All the cops came and I was hallucinating still cause I was withdrawing, but I still had the fake Adderalls. So I'm like, Oh, it was just terrible. And then I started, I saw this random invisible horse fucking come up to me like while the cops were there and for some they thought i was sober i don't know how but they did i was homeless in new mexico for like three days i slept outside of a gas station for three days straight i luckily i had a big following so i posted finally gained the the confidence to say hey guys i need help because yeah. my ego was trying to fake okay. that i'm not in this situation one. you know what i mean so i just posted on my story hey i need help and someone sent me like some money to get because i didn't have an id i lost my everything so this girl sent me some money got on a a greyhound to vegas and that's how i got back but then i detoxed in utah cedar city utah with my mom okay um for a month she put me in a three-story cabin with no running water no electricity no nothing 
just one month of detoxing like that. And uh, then ever since then, I've been sober. Um, and then still from there, that's when the struggle really started because now I have all these feelings and different, like I'm becoming alive again from yeah. death. Yeah. And uh, then f from there, my mom didn't know what to do with me because she was getting into a new relationship in Colorado. So she just sent me on a train to Oregon. I, basically, I just floated around and then I ended back here in Vegas and basically just tried to had to put the pieces back together of how life works. Yeah. And it took me a minute because then I, I and, you know, he me, I told him I'm dealing with the bad karma that I built up from all that. Sure past you know i don't even know how long that was of me doing drugs but it was a long time um and then so yeah basically since then i've been like trying to just i f honestly feel like the past two three months ha has been me finally understanding w and putting everything together of like oh shit now i get it i understand how to like uh sustain sobriety and un and and uh, be comfortable with my own thoughts yeah. um be comfortable being alone or and and understanding just everything you know what i mean kind of everything but yeah it took me a minute to to get to this point that uh, i'm just i'm just comfortable with my own thoughts basically yeah and, and i'm finally saying. there and uh, and it's just crazy looking back that through all of that it was just like a full tunnel vision of just not understanding anything, but I'm st I was still on the way still up. Still a mass, like a massive following. So like that's what was crazy with yeah. no handler. That's what my mom said. She's like, Quest, you had no person to handle you. No manager. You had no. You just did it, and you gained a following through it, and that's, that's why so it was so dangerous. Was that <laughs> the universe was handing you good things, but, but you were still doing bad things up there. So that that's why. It, it took me so long to understand that. You know what I mean? So that's basically the story. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's a great story. I didn't realize like some of that was so fresh in your life. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know what I mean, but, uh, I've been like three platform, years sober. Oh, almost four now. Thank you. That platform gives you an incredible opportunity to spread a message of hope and inspiration. For sure. And I see you doing that. And that's very admirable. For sure. Sometimes, because uh, you you know, I feel comfortable telling you, sometimes it, there's, you know, us addicts or anything, we struggle with the, with a lot of things, just thoughts in general. And I, str something I struggle with was sometimes I don't even want to talk about it. You know what I mean? Even though I feel like, like it, it I know it's going to help people, but some, I just overthink, yeah. like, I don't want people to only think of me as this thing you know what i mean but then there's days that i'm like yeah i do want to be thought of as this thing so like i don't know but i try i try to do as best as i can and then especially when i'm live streaming they get the raw yeah. version of me so whatever i'm feeling right then and there they're getting it yeah. and uh that's that i think that's i just told him i think that's where i found my burning passion is streaming or streaming live just because I really like the idea of people getting the raw uncut yeah. version of me with no s cuts and I and this podcast too because I can have conversations like this you yeah. know what I mean I love it so for sure super proud of you dude thank you man you too it's uh you know and for me imposter syndrome was probably one of the most difficult things yeah. to overcome and that's like, a real sh that's real you know shit I mean? like feeling like I'm not worthy and like you know and so it's it's really important for for me when I'm talking to people to talk about like a balance in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Physical, mental, spiritual, emotional well-being. Yeah. Like we don't have like this. You know, some people talk about like work-life balance. Mm -hmm. like we have a life. Yeah. We've been given a life, and like all of the parts of our life integrate and affect each other. Yeah. And so I love talking to people about, you know, like. Some guys are just obsessed in the sales world with their numbers, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But they're neglecting their family and, mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, or they're neglecting their health. And so, like, I, I just love talking to people about the importance of, like, a well-rounded, well-balanced life. Man, I'm so glad you said that. You know what I mean? Because that's I, something I, I I'm pray, learning now is I pray, balance. I meditate. I went to a TM. I, I never thought I could meditate because I couldn't shut my fucking right, brain right. off. You know what I mean? And that's so part I, of meditating, yeah. I went to a par I went to a TM center and I learned and I got a mantra 
and I learned like how to meditate and what to do with those thoughts when they float in and like mm. you know like the the whole journey for me has been like so incredible and uh, enlightening and I I just love sharing it with people well I like I love hearing it honestly because I feel like uh I'm from my spiritual journey I feel like everything it, what I've learned is they it, it the universe puts into your life exactly when you need to hear it. Like right when you said balance, yeah. I wasn't even thinking about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to remember that. Because literally right here, right now in this live moment, I wasn't even having balance. You know what I mean? So like just something like as simple as that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think I think that's, a, are, you have to leave, right? I do, unfortunately. I would love yeah. to. Do, I mean, I think we should consider here and talk well, that's for, why I want, for hours about it. Shit. It's okay. I understand it. But that's why I wanted to end with, I think that's a perfect way to end this is t balance. Yeah. Good thing for people to li that's listening. Just think about the yin and yang, dude. Balance. <laughs> yin and yang balance, yes. Well, Dark and light. Yeah, Just accept by. it. It's good to be here. Yeah. Yes, sir. I want to know how corny it would be to take a shirtless photo together. No, it's not corny at all. Yeah.